Hi everyone, uh, my name is Victor Lagunes. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you uh, OpenStack, thank you Rackspace to, uh, for having me here. Um, it's been um, quite a journey for us over the last couple of years. Um, really from, from conceptualizing what cloud could mean for, for Mexicans and Mexican IT staff within government and also to deploy that at an accelerated pace to, uh, to bring adoption. Um, this is our story. Um, I'm, um, I hold two, two jobs or two hats, I would say it like that. Uh, one of which is operate um, technology or IT at the office of our president in Mexico. So we have an IT shop in a very similar way as, as any other company. Um, you know, we do infrastructure, telecom, we do um, application development, we host data centers, um, and we have a little bit of focus on information security, if you can imagine. Um, the second one is actually drafting public policy at a federal level. Um, it's a very interesting story for us because most of my team are actually engineers. Um, so it's very difficult to move from solutioning to drafting public policy. So it's been quite a challenge for us to move away from what it means, for example, um, drafting a policy around the lines of uh, data center consolidation to actually drafting the solution to consolidate data centers. So bear with me. I think you'll, I'll, I'll be more clear as we, uh, as we move around, along, um, along the lines. Um, I'm going to give you a little brief overview of Mexico because, of course, that's what we Mexican uh, people do. Um, 120 million people, um, from which we actually have around 130 million cellular phones now. So people are carrying two phones now. Um, the digital divide is still very big. Um, more than half the country is not connected. So it's a big challenge for us to drive public policy when only half the country will be privileged from those services. So we're moving along the lines of bridging the gap, building more infrastructure, working with the different ISPs for them to, to get the incentives to bridge that gap all the way into you know, content and, um, and real our efforts into online uh, government service delivery. Um, we have, or we put out to the market, and I know it's probably not the, 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 the best phrase, around 100,000 technical and engineer people per year. So this is, this is big for us. Of course, we're moving them into areas of more focus, of more trending, for example, big data, more along the lines of um, open standards, uh, 3D printing, clones, drones, um, and, uh, and robotics. We've been some ma making some inroads into some you know, global awards, so our universities are, are actually um, fostering our, our success stories um, along those lines. But um, we... Um, by understanding this, we needed to bring all this opportunity back into how we do business. Um, for the first time in Mexico's story, we um, were able to understand ICT as a whole. And the first thing we did a couple years ago, and it's been an exercise we've been repeating a couple, a couple times per year, is diagnosing um, you know, the, the type of ecosystem that we actually live in. Um, it's, it's quite an opportunity to be there because we, d we actually work with any and all different ministries, from national security all the way to healthcare, to education, and so on. So this is, um, in a nutshell, what we found, and we are still moving away from it. So ICT viewed as a cost center, not really viewed as a strategic um, uh, area. Um, we didn't have the executive support to be able to bring that value into, into our, our C-suite, for example. Um, we didn't use to own our IT assets. And this was by presidential decree in 2006 uh, with the mindset or the philosophy that we were gonna, by leasing, we were gonna be uh, much more efficient in the use of budgets. It actually proved the contrary, and we lost control of IT assets. We lost ownership. Um, so a couple years ago, we changed the law a little bit to have um, IT or CIOs within each of the ministries create their own uh, strategies and their proposals as to what should we own inside the sector, what should we lease, and hybrids. 
For example, I was telling uh, the story that when I came into office, uh, most of my contracts were about to expire. And I had a leased data center built inside my premises. So I had 15 days to go. And I really didn't have a lot uh, that I could do because you know, I couldn't change provider, I couldn't tender. Uh, still, my critical applications were built on that data center. Um, they were embedded to it. They were somewhat replicated to another, a, 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 another data center, but really my hands were tied. This happened across the board. I can tell you stories of list, for example, structure cabling inside buildings and so on. So um, what we did and what we worked together with the industry was to be able to build um, um, best practices. So by yeah, cost-benefit analysis, uh, we're able to, to more or less tell what we should own, for example, cabinets, fake floors, and what we should lease, for example, processing, storage, networking capabilities. Um, we have around 850 data centers inside the whole federal government. This is not uncommon. For example, here in Canada, um, it used to be like around 500. Now through Shared Services Canada, for you who are familiar with the federal agency, they're going down to seven over the next 10, 10, 10 somewhat years. Four for, for um, production, two for design, and one for supercomputing. So we're learning around those lines, but we didn't make the decision to consolidate data centers by law. We're driving behavior by value, which is a little bit different. Um, everything's scattered. We don't connect to each other. I think this happens across the board in many countries. Um, so open standards are not really open because we cannot connect our own voice or IP networks. Um, we're not sharing resources. We're buying again and, ab and again um, the same assets. So for us to be able to make more, more efficient use of the, of the uh, IT budget was um, one of our uh, key priorities. Uh, the last one was po you know, policy and legislation. So f um, give you an example, the um, e-commerce on some countries in Latin America has grown to a fourfold while Mexican has only um, um, you know, grown twice fold over the last decade. We believe it's, it's partly, partially because of the whole legislative um, um, ecosystem in which you know, the whole supply and demand is not being covered correctly. So if something happens and my identity has been stolen, the, um, you know, the, the, the people who are, are, are going through, um, through those crimes, those, do, they, they don't have the tools because the crime actually doesn't exist for many of the cyber crimes that we have to deal um, with today. Um, we set out to create our national digital strategy. It covers, um, as I said, all the sectors. It's a massive undertaking. It's well funded, but we actually have to coordinate all the efforts from oil and gas, healthcare, education, um, public safety, and, and the Ministry of the Economy. And our whole objective is to bring Mexico into, this, into an information society standpoint by UN or OECD standards. Um, so any and all of our efforts are focused towards bringing uh, more citizen value, constituent value via IT spend or IT in investments. Um, how we do it, our objective is it's on the far left. So um, right now, we're actually one of the last um, um, positions on the OECD index. We are new in the OECD, but also in terms of digitization index, we actually have a long way to go. It has to do with connectivity. It has to do with affordability. It has to do with content, with how people use the internet, how people also use government services online. Um, so we work with different agencies, um, and we work in different fronts. So connectivity or interoperability is one. Um, digital skills in inclusion. It's not only to give uh, you know, a computer or a tablet to a 10-year-old. It's actually to have the whole ecosystem um, you know, behind, that, uh, behind that effort. Um, legal framework, um, we work around the lines of cybersecurity and also cyber legislation. So adhering to international treaties, being able to cooperate between uh, different agencies um, amongst um, really the, uh, the different countries. And that's, um, that's progressing. So we, we've already adhered to the Latin American one. We're, um, we're very close to adhering to the Budapest Treaty for those of you who are familiar with cybersecurity and cyber legislation. The main goal, well, the main objective is government transformation, which means 
you know, improving the conversation with, our, with ourselves as citizens. So I'm going to get into a little bit more into OpenStack, and I know why we're here. But I wanted to give you an overview of how we started and why we uh, are deciding the technology course that we're, that we're deciding. So we launched the ICT policy, the federal policy, last May. It's one year in which we're able to drive guidelines, behavior, in, in terms of how we strategize technology, how we buy, procure, how we uh, solution it, and how we inventory it across the federal government. And we use a tool to do that. So all agencies, including mine, um, by law, need to update the information there, have it up to, up to date. And uh, that's the way that we acquire technology, that we collaborate with the industry. Um, so far, within a year of production, we've, uh, we've dealt around 1,700 IT C uh, ICT projects, investments, everything from your 10K to a multi-million dollar investment, from data center all the way into interconnectivity, VPN networks, and so on, application development, uh, uh, what you can imagine. And what that information is giving us is driving the public policy. Because so far, it was, um, it was driven from, um, from an educated guess, but not from really science of building those databases up, up from, uh, from scraps. It's the first time that we actually are doing this. It's working because that now we can correlate databases with you know, the Ministry of, of the Budget, right? The, ministry, the, 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 the people who actually have the money. Um, so we can prove to them whether the investments that we're doing are driven or are driving results um, or return. Um, we invest around 1% of the budget um, into ICT. That's below uh, developed country standards. Um, to more or less, the US invests around 3% of their budget into technology. But we wouldn't be able to grow that if we cannot prove the return on X, or return on investment, or depending on the sector that you are. So we, be, we build this as, uh, with three fronts. Consolidation from buying one time and using it multi multi multiple times to interoperability to information security, to building those layers. Um, and we want to do this to, to, be, um, you know, to provide government services as a platform um, and, uh, and centralize that to citizens and to, uh, and to businesses. So we don't choose technology in my office. We do see uh, every and all vendors but we don't make the technology decisions inside my office. We actually allow um, or collaborate or contribute with the different ministries so that they have their own roadmap. We believe this is a respectful distance that we need to have because we need to actually only see at best, at best practices, that the ecosystem is neutral, that we're being efficient in terms of the use of budgets, that we're open in data, um, and within the next months, we're actually hosting the Open Government Partnership um, Forum in Mexico. And that means, basically, a lot of inventory data um, and databases are going, are going to be more open. Those databases that, um, really, in Canada, are way more open in the US as well. And you see economic growth coming out of it, industry coming out of it, transparency coming out of it. So uh, in the next month, uh, Mexico is, um, is joining that, that vote. Um, and I'm uh, and building redundancies without avoiding duplicities. So here is where um, really the open stack philosophy starts to um, collide with our own principles and with our own strategies. Um, through our own uh, efforts, we work with 232 um, uh, federal agencies. Um, any and all, I know you're not familiar with them probably, but um, we, um, we want to create a service-oriented um, architecture, also in collaboration with the industry. And this is somewhat of a journey, because um, we were moving away from leasing everything, so really operating contracts into owning part of the infrastructure, so in, in, uh, in collaboration with the, with, the, with the industry. Our centralized platform. Um, Within a couple of months, we're launching gov.mx, which is consolidating 6,500 um, online uh, citizen services. 
any and all services from the three levels of government are going to be posted in one single platform. Um, it's very ambitious, and it also is very concerning on the other hand, because by consolidating, yes, we're making best use of budgets. On the other hand, we're centralizing a lot of the points for, um, for exploits and vulnerabilities and attacks. Um, so of course, we're dealing with, with security as a forefront and as a priority. At the same time, that we want to make it easy for citizens to actually exploit those services or hopefully enjoy uh, government services. Gov.mx is an interoperability uh, hub. So an enterprise service hub, it doesn't store information at the, at the, at the core. It doesn't ex uh, expose private data of citizens. What we do is we connect via API to the different agencies and via uh, BPM, we are actually able to, f to, to understand the flows. Um, so we will go to your birth certificate and to your, you know, um, your foreign ex um, uh, ministry data if, 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 if you want to uh, have your new passport issued. So we can test or authenticate your identity in a better way um, because right now, basically, we're going to different offices to be able to finalize one single service. Um, we will host all information services as, uh, as well. So we will not have, um, you know, in here is CRA.ca, um, for example, um, as well as healthcare authorities and so on. We will consolidate information at a single standpoint and make it searchable. The reason why is, um, I think it has to do with, with usability and penetration, but also um, we, we are using uh, government services portals uh, on, on a very low standpoint, or, or we don't consume them in a very good way. So via consolidation and exposing the services that are most used to citizens, we believe that we're going to be growing um, uh, uh, usage way more. Um, And we're considering this, even though it's ambitious and it's, it's, um, it's happening in, over the next months, we're putting this as a forefront for a bigger scope um, uh, initiative, which is building the government cloud or the cloud ecosystem. Um, you're actually more, way more familiar with this if you're more te technical than I am. But really what we want to do is um, centralize, expose services on a very secure um, way. Be able to identify citizens um, via their own life cycle. If, the, if a service, of course, is inherent that it's not, it's not online, pure, purely online, then of course we need to go into, um, into uh, that ministry's office. If the service can be executed fully, fully uh, digital, then we, we're able to execute that with different um, methods of authentication. So um, I started by saying that we, uh, we had very strange ecosystem in Mexico. Um, we're moving from not owning IT assets, and that actually means that our IT staff was not managing IT fully into co-hosting or co-owning that IT ecosystem. For us, for us, the key values are quite uh, relevant because agility, Scala scalability, uh, automation, and, and predictability are key cornerstones of why we're designing the course that we're taking. Um, we don't believe that we have the whole uh, skills by ourselves. And I think many agencies, or most agencies in, in government, are actually in the same standpoint. And we should not have all the IT skills. Uh, on my mind, I should not be managing my own exchange servers. I should not be managing my own data centers at some levels. I should get help or support from the industry and get some levels covered, and then just focus on my core or my mission critical applications. And that's the reason why we're focusing a lot into this type of, of philosophies. If we deal only with core or mission critical apps and we get support from the industry to enable and, and, and stabilize our, our applications, we're able to deploy way faster in an accelerated pace. Um, as I said, we're not making 
massive decisions in terms of investment. Um, there have been some cases, and really ag around the globe, of let's build you know, four data centers, let's invest billions of dollars, let's manage it ourselves, let's, br let's build our own private cloud. And then creating those synergies with the industries um, is very hard. So if we really believe that we're building trusted partnerships with the, with the, with the private enterprise ecosystem or in, with the industry, then what we're doing is activating it, it, it as a whole. So private cloud for us means on-premise, but it doesn't mean fully managed by us. Hybrid cloud, of course, means expanding or, or building elasticity outside our walls and be able to build you know, better business continuity programs, DRPs, and some elastic um, elasticity that we do need for certain applications. And then activate public cloud in a more responsible way. Um, and I say this because we didn't have, for example, data sovereignty um, policies in Mexico. Um, a lot of our traffic flows back and forth to the US. A lot of uh, citizens' data was hosted outside the country. And uh, on the budgetary perspective, it makes sense. Services in the US are cheaper than services in Mexico if we're only dealing you know, data center services, so processing, cores, et cetera. But it was not responsible to do so because we were, we were actually bri bridging or breaching some laws around pri the Privacy Act, transparency laws, and so on. So we're bringing those, we're, we brought those services back and, um, and ensuring that we have the capacity to be able to sustain them. We have any and all technologies in the, in the different federal agencies. We have legacy systems that are 35 years old that are critical to some, to some uh, services being deployed. And right now, there's some, uh, a philosophy that we cannot move away from them. Well, let's start with what we can do. And well, that's why we want to be uh, completely open. So foster open standards. We don't really mind what type of technology is behind, but really being uh, quite clear about that philosophy. The second one is we don't have unlimited budgets. Someone here said, say that uh, some agencies in the US do have unlimited funding. We don't, so we have to start small and test the case. So, and by doing so, we're able to test the business case as well and understand what type of value that's driving to our citizens. The most important, um, uh, really imperative for us is to drive um, citizens' value. Um, so far, we're actually developing the case because it's different from the healthcare standpoint to the education standpoint to the energy sector to so on. Through OpenStax identity uh, uh, you know, um, interaction through the APIs, we're able to build really that, um, that umbrella to be able to activate much of our um, already um, active or assets that, are already been, that we already invested in. So I talked about 800 data centers. There is a policy to reduce that number, to consolidate, but there's also a policy to activate already made uh, investments. So we have tier four data centers in Mexico that are 90% unoccupied because we're moving many of those services to private enterprise clouds. What we want to do is activate them both and be able to manage risk via that approach. Um, if we move only to one of the sites, then um, then we lose control over the, over, the, over the information, the databases, or the constituents' data. But we, be, but we don't want to be over predictive to, um, to the information that, uh, or the type of technology that it's behind. So we work with the, main, the, the same vendors that, uh, that, that you see every day. Um, we have built very strong relationships with them. Um, they invest in Mexico a lot. So IBM, HP, Microsoft, Cisco have their own cloud orchestration technologies, but they also cooperate a lot with OpenStack. They bring a lot of value to the, to the ecosystem. So we're working with them in, 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 in collaborative approaches, in working groups, so that we draft this policy in collaboration with the industry. This is imperative for us because we actually don't want to break the ecosystem. We don't want to see or be perceived as co-opting or, or shutting down um, comp competition. 
we actually want to create a cloud that is more best practices and talks to trends more than legacy systems. So this is more or less our storyline. And, um, and what we're doing is building a private cloud in the middle, so on our interoperability hub. We already connected some of our data centers. We drive in the manual for interoperability with different ministries. So we're building VPN networks across the board, not only from the ministry's uh, perspective, but also from different applications. So national security applications for operational purposes, of course, have to interoperate between different national security agencies. Healthcare is the same. With, in Mexico, we have a very diverse healthcare ecosystem in which not only healthcare, but oil and gas operates their own ho hospitals, right? Um, also the military and the Navy, they operate their own uh, hospital ecosystem. But of course, when we're talking about you know, clinical record, we have to have portability in a secure way. We're working with, um, with companies such as you know, Rackspace and uh, all, the dat all the data center ecosystem in Mexico to build hybrid clouds. So investments made over the last decades, um, we are capitalizing and we're using them in a better format. So expanding our own footprint and be able to decide whether if it's, if it's AAA top secret or you know, it, that type of information, then it will reside within on-premise on data center of a national security agency. And it's already been done like that, but it was not written in the proper format. But if we want to expand that into elastic clouds for supercomputing and so on, we have to have the right tools to do so. So this is a little bit of, a, uh, of an ad for OpenStack, but um, we do believe it can help us a lot to accelerate adoption, to be able to bring this into, into fruition. As I say, our key critical dates are in a couple of months by presidential decree, we're launching the online services platform, um, August the 3rd. So we're in the last, you know, um, the, the last steps towards having that as a reality, and we're launching around, eight, um, like around 80 services per week. Um, and we're gonna be ramping up over the next months or years. Um, the, the, the second date is open government. So all these databases that are actually um, our propriety, and I mean that as a, as a citizen, we're gonna be opening that up for transparency purposes and also for economy creation, uh, for explosion, for correlation. So we're quite, um, we're quite thrilled in the way that um, this is being built. We, we learn a lot from, um, from the ecosystem. We only deal with philosophies and best practices, and we're collaborating with, um, with the industry in such a way that we're, we can uh, accelerate adoption. With that, I can open the floor for questions if you have any. Um, I think I already discussed some of these key points, but I'm, uh, I'm happy to take questions if you, if you want. How is your application migration strategy? It's a, it's a very difficult one. We, um, it depends who you talk to. For example, I, I actually operate one of the smallest agencies because we, ha we don't have citizens facing services. Um, and it's even hard for us because of legacy. What we do is, and we're trying to create that as a best practice, is when you have an application development contract with some of the software factories, we call it, so one of the either a Microsoft Channel or you know um, um, a different a, a different company in, in, in Mexico, we ha you have to embed there the migration um, uh, journey or the migration path. If you do have a data center contract happening you do have to have a journey to virtualization embedded into the contract. So, so far there were mostly co-location contracts over the last you know, 10 years, we're mostly taking infrastructure and putting that into industry data, uh, data centers. What we're doing that I now is, yes, move it, but embed a very uh, accelerated virtualization uh, um, policy or, or implementation policy. Oh, I think I think right now we're 
probably this is number growing, but it's like 90, 10, and we're still very much in the physical space. Um, I'm, I apologize. Um, he's asking about our ratio between physical uh, server via or and uh, versus virtual space or virtual servers, and uh, it's a gut answer right now because it's migrating. But I think it's like 90, 10. Um, we're moving there, and uh, any new contract, either it's on-premise data center or it's an industry data center, it's a virtual one. It, ha it does have the colocation um, you know, um, line in there, but you have to migrate it in the, next, uh, in the, in the expiration of the contract. Um, there are some applications that we cannot control and some applications that are heavily uh, tied to the machine itself. Um, so we work in that as a you know, one-to-one. In reality, when I, uh, when I arrived and I took office, I took you know, um, you know, a number of data centers, and I didn't know what was in them. And you know, there was some inventory, and I ran some discovery uh, mechanisms. But I ended up with half of information. So what I did was start shutting down machines and see who was complaining. And for, uh, and for like most part, no one did. So I was able to migrate at an accelerated pace or in a better uh, format just because I didn't know what was stored in certain machines. Go ahead. Is there a shared networking component to this overall strategy? The departments or for consumers? It is, it is very much a shared services infrastructure. Um, well, what we want to uh, provide, and uh, we're already doing so, we operate a private network um, that has three components to it. Uh, telepresence, video conference, and some, um, you know, uh, some critical applications going through that network. It's mostly a metropolitan network. Most, most of the um, federal agencies in, in Mexico operate in Mexico City. Some of them expand, of course, their operation nation nationwide. But what we're doing with that network is connecting data centers and offering that back as a service. Now we're doing infrastructure only right now. But we're testing, um, we're piloting, for example, um, some commoditized applications such as email, but just to be able to connect to Active Directories and LDAPs and be able to um, have better grip on asset management and access management uh, at a federal level. So we ran a study uh, last year with USAID uh, in which we were able to work around um, diagnosing and also proposing what could be a shared services infrastructure and who could actually operate that. Um, and as I said, we're not, we're actually collaborating very well with the industry, but in a, it's a different conversation. We're not only saying what we want to acquire, we're saying how we want to manage the ecosystem. So we're bringing them on board and we're selecting which phases or which layers of that is gonna be um, shared, meaning VPN networks, telco, ISP, internet, for example, all the way into what applications can we test so their voice over IP, for example, some other applications just to go through that network because it's part of it is physically, um, well, the network is owned by the government, but some applications deserve that and some others should actually be deployed via just regular VPNs um, using the support of the telecom ecosystem in Mexico. I understand, and let, uh, let me translate the question. Um, the gentleman is asking whether it's a federal initiative and how are we communicating this with, different, with the different agencies and how we're working with them. Uh, now, the answer is yes. Um, the office itself it's, it resides inside the office of the president, so it gives it uh, the relevance and the priority. Second one, it's, and this is the tricky part, it's a coordination unit. So we don't operate, I, I operate the budgets inside my office, that means technology procurement, but the coordination for digital initiatives outside to coordinate um, different sectors, we don't operate that budget. That budget um, is actually allocated to the sector or to the different ministries. We work hand in hand with them. Uh, 
I would like to be perceived, or my team, uh, I would like my team to be perceived as kind of a consulting agency to all federal government. So my team is very much a technology team. So we have data center experts, we have um, network experts, information security, application development, and so on. We don't have sectorial uh, expertise, so we don't, we don't mind or we don't care, I don't know how to say it, but um, about that core critical components of healthcare systems, right, or SCADA networks. So that's mainly for oil and gas, how they operate their own pipeline. But data center consolidation, that's a best practice, and there, that's where we bring value. The other part is, by law, the different agencies are obliged are, um, to, to report their, um, their strategy, so meaning what are they thinking about for next year. Second, what type of procurement process are they going to choose? So whether it's going to be Infotech via, you know, Infotech actually operates as a, as a university, but also owns and operates uh, technology infrastructure. They own data centers. Um, Infotech for us um, is, for example, when I say government data center one, that's one of Infotech's data centers, right? Data center N, government data center N could be, a, 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 right now we're in talks with some national security agencies because we do need them to reside in a properly secured facility. Um, so we communicate hand in hand. A lot of it, I can say, it's willingness for change to happen. Yeah. And then there's the law, <laughs> and there's yeah, a, you know, a legislation. So he's asking about vendor locking and uh, how are we evangelizing or driving this change. Um, and we're, we're doing so through, of course, uh, mainly support from our president, but second, with policy. So we created, as I said, ICT policy. And ICT policy is actually, a, you know, it's embedded in the law. So if you're, um, if you're procuring a data center, it has to be with open standards. If you're procuring a, you know, an application, so for electronic link and record, it has to be with open standards. It has to. Voice over IP networks, it has to. Because if not, you know, ciphers get lost. You, know, you can call from each other, but then the real features are not there. And it's, it's definitely, um, it's not making best use of budgets. And I know I overuse that phrase, but the, the reality is if we buy once, we can replicate. If we buy once, then if I have you know, different networks, we can interconnect without losing features. And that's what, we, what we're talking about. So the ICT policy uh, was born inside this office, and it's, it's basically communicated and launched across, across the federal government and some state level municipalities for certain applications. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, th I think the answer, he's asking about information security and how we, how we actually tackle the, the challenge or the issue. Um, I think it's two front. The first one is um, really best practices. Um, we don't wanna say you have to adhere to this standard because it depends what type of information you have. And also there's al already legislation, so the second part is leg legislation, around where should a type of data B, and, um, and it's our responsibility as CIOs to understand that and to declare that type of information you know, in those layers. So that's a front, that's a, that's a human decision. So if I'm dealing with top secret information or with you know, transactional information, you know, informational, then I declare it as you know, within those layers and by law it has to reside in a specific, you know, sp and has to be handled in a specific way. So, and then the next question is technology. 
w I mean, we, um, we, throughout the ICT policy, we of course recommend best practices, meaning you know, following ITL, following COVID, following you know, ISO 27001. Um, it's responsibility of the different agency to do so. I'm not an auditing team. I'm a consulting team. There, is the, there are auditing teams out there that will ensure that oil and gas you know, has its SOX compliance, right? It you know, behaves in, its, in, in the right way with, with citizens' information for healthcare, for the, in the financial sector. The Transparency Law and the Privacy Act actually dictate that. We only there to ensure that it's happening um, because sometimes w for the sake of either saving money or buying quickly, um, we oversee those situations. We believe via consolidation of practices, we can actually ensure that we're shielding ourselves better from, uh, from cyber attacks and so on. I'm not taking track of, track of my time, so I'm trusting someone is. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the question was around uh, language barriers um, from OpenStack being mostly English written. Um, we deal with this every day in every front. And most of my technical staff and most of the, of the um, CIO's offices, technical staff, uh, deal with this every day. Um, I do believe technology, you know, this, is, this is my uh, really um, interpretation of it, you know, transcends a little bit of the language barrier, even though it's in English. Um, but we, um, we, have, we have programs in English. We work a lot with the universities as well because it's, a co it's an ongoing concern for the industry as well. So the Cisco's and HP's go on higher, and then they spend the better part of the first year you know, on English training, you know, before heading into your CCNA and so on. So it's an ongoing concern. I believe it's going to be less and less as we move forward, right? As managing, as, as you know, just my programmers, they're coding and they, re they don't really uh, mind if it's in English or in Spanish. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's. It I, this is one of my, my asks when I talk to, to Rackspace or to any of the, of, the, of the big ones or small ones. Help us get better. So um, get more skilled. You know, draw talent out. I, you know, I put in there in one of the priorities is driving uh, and fostering IT staff. When we moved away from managing contracts into managing services, like deploying citizen services, we also acknowledge the value of having an IT staff that is embedded into driving value to a citizen. So in order to do that, they need to be prepared. So I was talking to Rackspace CTO just uh, this morning, to John, and I said that it's a little bit unfair on our side because first, we don't pay very well. So if you're you know, a good engineer, you would look at government like you will not look at government opportunities. Second, we don't actually develop talent very well. So we actually have initiatives now to be able to collaborate with industry and expose those curricula or those certifications and so on in a better way. And there's a lot of subsidies around it. And third one, there's this perception reality that administration changes mean you could actually or you will actually lose your job. So who in the right mind would actually like to work in government? And we're finding the people. And I believe with, with basically talent development um, efforts, we not only can actually bring the people, but be the best place to develop yourself because you'll actually be able to offer all the curricula from all the companies in one single spot. So it actually, our, our talent development um, uh, initiative is very similar to, to a hub, to, enter, to an enterprise service hub, where companies such as Rackspace can actually connect expose some of their services via API, their online curricula, their online development courses, and have us as IT staff connect there and really develop our plan. So it's, key criti it's extremely critical for us to be able to offer opportunities there. Go ahead. Can you elaborate on how you ended up selecting OpenStack as opposed to other virtualization or consolidation strategies? Yeah, I mean, as, a, as an example, 
I operate my data centers with VMware right now. And uh, it was a stress test, and I had all the vendors come, uh, come and, and, and actually share with me why theirs was, was, was better. Um, and we decided via the skill set that we already had and the infrastructure that we already owned to be able not to, to again buy and again replicate and, use, uh, and, and duplicate the, um, the investment. Um, I think that's, that case actually happens a lot. What we want to do right now is be able to deploy an open standard across the board. And if you actually have and own your data center, we're able to actually connect to it. You're able to, be, you know, be, we're, we're taking advantage of, of basically the open philosophy of OpenStack because it's extremely diluted and, and segregated, the type of technologies that we have across government at the three layers. So OpenStack for us, um, it's answering those questions in the right way. And uh, within a couple of months, we're actually launching. We're in beta testing right now, uh, so it's, it's ongoing. In uh, August 3rd, we're launching. And uh, in, in Tokyo, in the next OpenStack, uh, hopefully I'll be presenting uh, our, our lessons learned from our first months of operating this type of environment and architecture. OK. Well, with that, I thank you very much for your time and interest. And I'll be staying around here if you have some uh, questions uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. Thank you.